All right, we're gonna come back together. Thank you. All right, we got some good ones here. And thanks for participating online. So I'm just gonna read through a few of them. Um, Meltdown at drop off, throwing a tantrum when um, when they can't get preferred seat in the cafeteria. Coming in from the playground, they're not lining up. Um, again, that was throwing the fit. Um, if children are not following directions to transition from the gym for indoor gross motor, and I love this, the flop and drop <laughs> like, uh, when they don't want to transition. So some ways, um, of course, I don't know exactly which ones coordinate with which ones, but some ways we can ensure a supportive environment are to count down and praise even for small victories. Count down, give choices, time prompts, count down with clear expectations, have songs for let's going inside, for going inside, so that's probably the lining up one, walking around the playground to get some of that out, so that's maybe the transition that you go from all of that play with each other we take a lap around the playground and then we go inside. It's really good. Um, give uh, the expected song. That song is that transition trigger. Oh, that means we're getting ready to go in. Clear expectation choices. Remind child that they're currently seating lunchtime went fine. Praise trying different spots, encourage new choices. Okay. And then count down clear expectations. You guys did awesome. All right. We're ready for our second dot. <laughs> Okay, so now if you want to refer to your poster, we're looking at the second row. We're, look, we're going to talk now about how to encourage positive behaviors. And you have in your handouts a great summary sheet. You can look at it anytime. Looks like this. It's called Encouraging Positive Behaviors at the top, and it's just a great summary of what we're going to talk about today. So there are three main principles in terms of encouraging positive behaviors that we want to talk about today. The first one is that cooperation follows connection. We know in our work with children and we know in our work with adults, if we aren't connected to a child, they don't really care what we have to say. And if we don't have any kind of connection or if we have a negative connection, they're going to go the other way from us. So it's really important that we establish a connection first so that children will want to engage with us and will want to cooperate in school or at home. Secondly, it's important that we fill their emotional buckets with positive reinforcement and specific positive reinforcement. So we're going to talk lots today about how to fill their buckets with some of the positive things that we can do, things we can notice, things we can do that fill their buckets. And third, we want to make deposits. We want to make deposits throughout the day, all our time with them. Notice things that are going well, notice them, pay attention to them, and make those deposits through the day. So these are the three principles we're going to talk about in this section about how to encourage positive behaviors with our children. We also want to remember that we want to model this for our families so that the things that we're doing at school that are positive and that are working, I want to share it with my families at the end of the day and during conference time so that they can also have this positive approach. We know that our bucket fills when we feel connected. We all know that and our children know that too. Also, our bucket begins to drain when we feel disconnected. So when we feel fearful or tired or angry, our bucket starts to drain, we start to lose it, that's when our children start to lose it and they fall apart. And they need our help to intervene before they get to that point where everything is run out of their bucket and they have nothing left. So as a child, we know that children are seeking connection to us first as an adult. Children that are first born seek it with their primary caregiver or their secondary caregivers. So that first primary connection is key. We know that in terms of attachment theory, how important it is that children have a solid connection with some significant positive adult. Then children can learn to connect to others, their peers, other adults in their environments, and importantly to themselves. That connection, however, starts with that significant adult in the beginning. So we have a nice demonstration here with our <laughs> student and our teacher. And Walt is going to demonstrate for us one of the, this is one of the great strategies that I like in this section. We're going to talk about the five to one rule. Does anybody know this rule or use it? Five know what phrases it? to one. Exactly. 
And so we're going to talk about some of the different ways we can use those five phrases. It's good, because we know that before we ask anything challenging of a student, we better have given them lots of positive reinforcement or there's nothing there for them to draw on to do that challenging behavior. So we have Walt here playing with blocks, and we have his imaginary bucket here. And as we practice some of these strategies, Brooke is going to put deposits into his bucket. Okay. So one of the things that we can do is simply make eye contact. Some students like eye contact, some students don't. But for those that respond well, they really like it when we look at them and validate who they are and that we notice them. We can also just get close and touch children if they're okay with that. Some children are more accepting of touch than others. But physically being close to them lets them know that they matter to us and that we're attending to them. It's also important that we really be present with the kids. So as they're playing, Brooke is paying close attention to him. She's not looking at her phone. She's not scanning around the room and looking everywhere else but at him. She's right here present with him and enjoying him. She's on his level. She's looking at him eye to eye. She's right there for him. And he knows if she's really attending or not attending. Another example is that we can show interest in our ideas. If he starts taking it in another direction, she notices, she reinforces that. She's like, how cool it is what you're doing. We can show interest in what they're doing in their play. Another thing that we can do to fill their bucket is we can pay attention to them. And whatever it is they're doing, wherever it is they are, we pay attention to what they're doing, to show them that we're really attending to what they're doing and what they like. When someone tries to interrupt her, she says, please wait, I'm here with Walt. Another thing we can do to fill their bucket, <laughs> he liked that one, is we can laugh at their jokes. So if they're doing something silly or goofy or funny, we laugh with them and let them know that even if it's kind of a silly little joke, we think they're funny. They love that when we laugh at their jokes. <laughs> we can also, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> Good. Good. We can also let them take the lead and play. So if, if Walt decides he's going to start adding some different components to his play and does something different, we can go, yeah, that's cool. Take it away. Go with it. As long as it's safe and it's not hurting anyone, by all means, let them take the lead. Another great tool we can use is to compliment them secretly. In other words, I, she's going to say something nice about him to me, another person in the classroom, not directing it at him directly, but she's saying it nicely about him where he can hear it. And then he knows she's complimenting him out loud. That really makes him feel good because she's saying what a great engineer he is. And that really makes him feel good to hear him complimented to me while she's watching. There's another deposit in his bucket. Another thing that we can do is build their confidence. If we see that they're really struggling with a task, we can encourage them to hang in there, to persist, to try another way, and build their confidence to do risky behaviors. She helps him figure out new ways, <laughs> building his confidence. We can also just really enjoy their company. Children know if we like their company or not. And there's some children who we are more at ease with than others. They know that. And so it's important when she's working with him that he knows she really likes him. She really wants to be there with him. So when kids try to interrupt, she's like, no, I'm busy here. I'm with Walt. They know that he knows that she really likes his company. We can be really enthusiastic about their effort. If a child is really struggling and the product isn't quite what they wanted, and we have kids who get really frustrated with that, frustrated with that, we can say, you know, it may not look the way you want, and I love your effort. You're really trying here and praise their effort rather than their product. And lastly, it's important that we give away control when we can. So again, if he wants to take his play in another direction, he wants to bring in another object, or he wants to move it to a different part of the room, as long as it's safe and he's not hurting himself or anyone, let them take the control in, their, in directing their own play and their activities. So as you can see, they've had a great interaction time here, and she's put lots of deposits in his bucket. And it may be that he loves this block time, but he doesn't quite so much love leaving it and going to lunch. So Brooke has done this intentionally to get him ready for a time that's going to be more challenging. So when we say, okay, you know, Walt, it's time for us to put it, and we've given him all the transition cues, 
when we say it's time now to put the blocks away and go to lunch, even if he's kind of frustrated and loses some of those deposits from his bank because he was pretty mad, still he's got some supply left in his bank. He's got some reserve to be able to cooperate with us even when he wasn't really crazy about it. So again, as you said, we need to remember for every challenging direction we give, we need to have given at least five positive points ahead of time. And that takes some practice. And we're going to talk about some of the things we can do to practice that. Thank you both. Great <laughs> demonstrations. <laughs> so another way we can think about this five to one rule is for ourselves. So for instance, you know, if my boss has to come to me with a correction, I would much rather that she come to me and tell me five really great things I did before she says, yeah, and we had a complaint too. <laughs> Same thing applies to us. And if we're, if we're working on a team, I'm going to build up my team as much as possible with specific positive praise before I say, and here's something we need to work on that's a challenge. Works, works the same for us. So here's another tool that I really like. Anybody use a one-on-one -on -one schedule with their child, with their kids, or their classrooms? Okay, it's a cool tool, I think. What we do with this tool is I pay attention to each of my students and I figure out for each one of them something that they love to do. So as I mentioned earlier, I know that Brooke loves to color, and she's really good at coloring. So I put together a one-on-one -on -one schedule. I literally write it down for all of my kids, and I actually post it on the wall so that the families know I'm spending unique time with their child every week. I'm doing at least a couple of minutes with each child somewhere throughout the week. So my special time with Brooke is Monday morning. She comes in. I've got those coloring books ready. There's not many kids there yet, and she loves it. It's our one-on-one -on -one time together. For instance, with Jack, he's there with us for long days. His parents don't pick him up until late on Friday afternoon, so we're in the gym together. Oftentimes, it's just a few of us left in the gym. So that's the time that Jack and I play trains. And again, that is our special time, and he knows it, and I know it. And it really builds that connection and that positive reinforcement for our kids. They realize that we pay attention to what they love, and we spend individual time with them doing those positive things. Can't go wrong with that kind of approach. <coughs> Usually we send notes home to parents, and what do we say in those notes? Things aren't going so well a lot of times with the notes we send home. And our suggestion is instead, let's send bucket filler notes home. So if Brooks had a really good day, or if Walt's had a really good day, and if he learned to put his blocks up and go to lunch without, without an issue, I'm going to send a note home and say, Walt did great today going from blocks to lunch. I'm going to send a note home saying, Brooke did great today coloring this morning. She colored five pages. It really, parents love to get these notes. We love to hear where our children are doing well. Another example is we can do this at a classroom level, and Brooke is going to demonstrate for us. I want to, in, in addition to reinforcing my children individually, I want to reinforce my whole classroom when things are going well throughout the day. Because the more I reinforce the classroom is running well, the more it's going to run well. So one of the things that we can do is we can have an apron with a pocket or two, and we've got 20 pennies in the bag. And what I do is each time I hear myself praising the whole class, I take a penny out of the Ziploc and I put it in my pocket. And the idea is by the end of the day, I put all those pennies into the other pocket so that it reminds me to reinforce my whole classroom 20 times at least during the day. If you're lucky enough to have people who can come in and observe and take notes for you and do that for you, great. If not, this allows me to do it on my own. And it just reminds me to do that reinforcement with my whole class throughout the day. And we know what amazing difference this makes. We know how that changes the whole tone of the classroom. Your turn to practice. All right. OK. So now we're going to connect the next dot of connection. Um, we want to remember the point of the connect the dots and referencing back to what we learned about the brain, right? So what did we do in ensuring a supportive environment? What are we responding to? An anticipated need. Yes, of safety, right? So what are we responding to with dot two? Right, the emotional state. So let's assume that we've done an awesome job at making them feel safe. Our transitions are smooth, they know what's expected of them, and we're really not having any of the alarms go off for safety. 
But the next thing we have to do is make sure that they're feeling good about themselves and that they feel connected to the class. So if you have a new student, you probably see a lot of challenging behaviors. And that's because two things are out of whack. Safety, everything's new. And two, they don't have a sense of belonging yet. So it's really, really important to recognize when you're seeing tons of challenging behaviors from new students, it's because they're seeking that connection first before you're going to get any kind of cooperation. So I want you to think back on your hot button and assume you've already ensured a supportive environment because that's what we did with the blue dot. And now I want you to take your green dot out. And I want you to tell me how you're going to make five deposits into this bucket before that challenging behavior happens. So if there's a frustration or meltdown was one of them, tell me what five things you're going to do before that meltdown happens, because most likely you know when it's going to hit, right? Everybody's not in here. Okay, a couple minutes. We think you guys are doing a great job. So let's move to our third dot, which is emphasizing positive discipline. We're going to look at, in this section at some great, yes. Okay. Um, so our question was, I mean, I know a lot of, of, of times, a lot of prompts, a lot of structure for them. Um, how do you, or what is your experience of them transitioning from such a structural environment? To less structure? So, yeah, you know, less footprints and less squares and... You know, Good question. So what's your experience? Have you seen kids go from a, a, supposit, a supportive environment to less? Have you seen that happen? I don't know, so I'm asking. I don't work with Okay. <laughs> okay. The question is, if we set up a really great supportive environment in our center, have we seen what happens when kids move to environments that are less supportive? That's our question. Yes. I want to see what they have to say first. Um, Anybody have experience with that? I think as children mature, they want less structure. It's a, it's a lot of times a natural thing that they want that structure. I'm, I'm a mother of five, so just that they want that structure younger. And there is a reason that you know teenagers are not our best friends because they they're going away. So with that maturity, you know, it kind of comes natural. So there's an answer that if you can't hear online, that children oftentimes want more structure, need more structure when they're younger, but as they get older, they want less and they need less. Yeah, as we teach them when they're younger, we teach them the practices that they should be doing automatically, like the example with the footprints. They should eventually learn how to just stay in line without those visual cues. So those visual cues are like little training wheels, and as soon as they don't need them, you can take them off. Yes. Good answers. Great. Yes. Jenny online says, yes, my kids come undone behaviorally when they get home from preschool because home is not as structured as school is. Yeah. And so what she's learning the hard way is that they're getting the structure they need at school. And when they when we come home, for, for most of us, it's less structured at home. And sometimes that's okay. And sometimes I even need more structure. I still need some structure at home more than I get. And I think your question points out a really good observation is that really it's about watching our kids. And as they move from a structured environment to a less structured, some kids are going to do fine. Some of my kids, when I transitioned them, I had to work with the teachers in the new setting and they had to give them more supports for a while. And that's really what we call transition supports, going from one setting to the next where it, the expectations are different and they always are. We have to work with the new staff who get them to work with what the child needs and what the environment offers. So it's a really good question you raised. Any other thoughts? Um, we have an online question. Could you give suggestions about filling the bucket of a child who seems to feel safe and has positive emotions, yet still does not want to transition from playground or transition to the bus? OK. So we've got a child who seems to be pretty well adjusted, but doesn't want to go from the playground or to the bus? Still, still does not want to transition from playground or transition to the bus. Pretty normal, right? So what do you suggest? What do you all suggest for that? Yeah. Um, I worked in the Kentucky Children's Foundation like before, and uh, I did the crafts for the kids. And like the first time, you may get it messy, but when you do it 
So by practice. Yeah, by practice. Practice, which may, many times of going to the leaving the playground even when they didn't want to or going to the bus, practice helps. What else helps? Uh, yeah. We have an online participant using the acronym ACT, A-C-T, acknowledge the emotion, communicate the limit, target the alternative. Yay. We're going to talk about a strategy very much like that. So I like that. Acknowledge. Acknowledge the emotion is A. Communicate, communicate. the limit is C. And then T, target, target the alternative. It's a great strategy. Yeah. I just had a question. Uh, what if it's, there's a reason, like the boys being bullied on the bus? Yeah. So what if there's a really good reason that they don't want to get on the bus? How can we address that one? <clears throat> what do you think? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? <clears throat> What do you do? I mean, because sometimes children have legitimate reasons why they don't want to leave the playground or they don't want to go on the bus. What can we do? I was going to say, if you have a problem solving conversation with them, if they're here and they're in that place where they can, oh, just ask them about it. Oh, good idea. Her response was, get them to hear and problem solve. And a lot of times, if we ask children in a non-threatening way, like, is there a reason you don't want to go on the bus today? A lot of times, if they have verbal skills, they'll tell us. Or we can ask the bus driver, is there something going on? Yeah. That, I feel like that's more for once you get to school age children. I think for this age group, that'd be a little bit more difficult. Depends. Some can tell you, some yeah. can't. You're right. Some can't begin to verbalize that terrible things are happening on the bus. It's true. Or if, like, if they're not wanting to get on the bus and they're starting to throw that tantrum, you can be like, how is your body feeling? Like, what do you feel inside? And it's like, well, do you think that your heart is beating really fast because you're nervous? It's like if you ask them to think about how they feel physically, you can kind of connect that to the way they're thinking. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Helping them name how they're feeling. It's a great skill. No. An online participant suggests reflective responding, such as, I see that you don't want to get on the bus, or you seem really upset about getting on the bus. Yes. Reflective responding. And that's exactly what Brooke was doing earlier. She, mm -hmm. she was naming Walt's feelings. I see that you're frustrated. That helps to just have someone go, hey, I see that you're upset here. That is a start in the dialogue of finding a, finding a solution. All right, well, let's look at some specific strategies. Those are great suggestions that you all have. And if you'll, if you'll read the, the font in color with me, let's look at why it's so hard to teach behaviors. If a child doesn't know how to read, we teach. If they don't know how to swim, we teach. If they don't know how to multiply, we teach. If they don't know how to drive, we teach. If they don't know how to behave, what do we do? Punish. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of times we punish instead of teaching. Why is it so hard to teach behavior? Why do you all think? We have to behave ourselves. <laughs> yeah. It requires us to behave well. What else? Why is this a hard one? Patience. Yes, and those are hard to come by. It takes patience and consistency. Online agreed. It's also not a really clear cut area of performance. Behavior can be pretty variable in different settings with different people, with peers versus adults. It is not a clear cut. Yes. Rachel online, before you started that last statement, says because there are so many different aspects to consider. Uh -huh. Yeah. Just, she had that in before you started. Yeah. So this, it's, this is why this is a challenging area for a lot of us and for our children, because this is a complex deal. Yes? Well, the other thing, what we teach with our limited time with a child, they may go to their home environment or other environments and <coughs> for reading or swimming. The other environments don't teach them not, how not to swim. They don't actively teach them how uh -huh. not to read. Um, there can be active behaviors in the child's life that encourage behavior uh -huh. that's inappropriate. Yep, it's true. So they might be learning very different expectations and limits, very different limits in other settings than they're learning at school. Absolutely. And then they're like, okay, which one do I do? The amazing thing is kids know how to behave in different settings. They know that what can, they can get away with at school, they can't get away with at home and vice versa. They figure that out, that different settings have different limits. Good points, you all. Well, let's look at some specific strategies. You have in your handout a sheet that looks like this. 
that has seven different strategies for handling, emphasizing positive discipline. And that the great example act is one is similar to one that we're going to look at in just a little bit. But I just want you to be able to see this and know this is chock full of resources. And this is just a small example of what more available is available online on Connect the Dots website. Yes? Do you mean positive punishment like you're giving a punishment versus like taking something away? Uh, no. Where are you seeing punishment? Pos I mean discipline. Sorry. Oh. By positive discipline, we mean using positive phrasing to correct children. I don't mean punishment in, in any sense of the word. It's a good yeah. question. So you'll see that we have some of the strategies that are listed here include setting clear expectations. We've talked about that already. Modeling appropriate behaviors. We've been doing that. Redirecting behaviors. We've done some of that. Using flippants is what we're going to talk about soon. Uh, allowing children choices. We know that's always a healthy thing to do. Give them choices of what is a realistic choice and don't give a choice if it's not a choice. Um, giving logical consequences using when-then statements. When you do this, then this will happen. And actively ignoring inappropriate behaviors. If there's behaviors that I can ignore that don't hurt anyone, I'm going to ignore them. And oftentimes they'll go away. Now, if, they, if I ignore a behavior and it escalates and then I have to step in, then I'll use one of these other strategies. But I always try ignoring first if it's not hurting anyone. So we have lots of strategies here. We're going to concentrate on the flip it strategy just as an example. This is the resource where it comes from. Flip it stands for, it's an abbreviation for identifying children's feeling, setting limits, asking questions, inquiries, and prompts. And it's very much like the ACT that our online person said, very much like that. So we're going to, as Walt is playing with his blocks, Brooke is going to help him work through this flip it scenario. So what's happening here is that he's playing with his blocks and he might be getting a little bit frustrated. So she's going to first help identify his feelings. Because I don't want him to flip his leg. <laughs> oh, I can see you're feeling frustrated with those blocks. So the next thing she's going to do is she's going to remind him what our limits are in school. When we play with the blocks, we handle them with gentle hands. And the next thing she's going to do is she's going to ask him some questions to help him figure out what's going on with his feelings. If you're frustrated, the blocks won't hit or fit together. What else can we do to get our frustration out besides banging them? So she's asking him questions, helping him problem solve, helping him close his lid and do some problem solving. And lastly, if he needs help, she's going to prompt him for what he might do differently. So remember that book we read yesterday? Henry stomped his feet when he felt frustrated. We can do that. Or you could simply say, I need some help, please. Do either of those sound good for, to you? Sure, I'd love to help you. So she's helped him problem solve <laughs> through his identifying his feelings, setting, set, setting those safe limits, asking some questions, and prompting him to problem solve what he needs to figure out. So flip it is a great technique that helps us change the whole tone of a child's behavior. We encourage you that if these, if a lot of these are new strategies to you, pick one or two that really speak to you. Pick one or two and practice them a lot. Go to the website, check out the resources, look at the videos. There's great videos on all of these strategies that you can dig into deeper. We encourage you to work on one or two at a time. Once you get comfortable with those, then you can add another to your repertoire. Another example of using a, a strategy for emphasizing positive discipline is to use positive discipline language with my family. So as we talked about before, if I find that active ignoring is working, then I'm going to share that with the families at the end of the day. So for instance, I might say, as they come to pick up their child, I might say, I found today that when I actively ignored when Walt was whining for more dessert, that he just moved on and finished his lunch and went right on and did fine. So I'm sharing with them that active ignoring works so that they can also use it at home. Sometimes we don't think to do that. Sometimes we think we have to respond to everything that they do and say, and a lot of times we can simply ignore it and it will go away. That's our first line of defense. Another strategy we can use is helping children connect what they're feeling to what they're saying and what they're doing. So if Brooke is playing and she starts getting frustrated and upset, I can look at her face and say, your face is telling me that you're, 
she's feeling pretty good. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if she's frustrated, I can say your face is telling me that you're frustrated, which is helping her learn that emotional vocabulary that she might not have. Kids don't automatically know when they're feeling mad, sad, glad, or any of those. So we're teaching her the words for how she's feeling. Was there a comment online? Okay. <laughs> so another couple of strategies that we can use, we can, as Dave said, we can model calming strategies. And we have, that is our, really our goal in school, is to model how to be calm with our kids. One of them that we can use is we can do either cranky lotion or cranky soap. So as the teacher, I'm going to get cranky sometimes, right? And so when I'm feeling that my blood pressure is rising, I might just say, here's our model teacher, I'm going to step aside for a minute, and I'm just going to wash my cranky away. And I'm going to go wash my hands. Those are my calming glasses. And I'm going to step aside and take a little break until I feel better. Same way with cranky lotion. If I'm getting really agitated, I'm going to say to Walt, Walt, I'm going to step over here and just massage my hands for a minute. I'm going to get some lotion and I'm going to do a hand massage just for a minute to pull myself back together so I don't lose it and I can be more appropriate with him. So cranky lotion, cranky soap is a great strategy. Another one is a strategy we call STAR, which stands for smile, take a deep breath, and relax. I want you guys to practice this with me. Let's all smile, take a deep breath, and relax. I mean, even doing that makes you feel calmer, right? So if I see myself losing it or feel myself losing it, I'm going to post this on the wall, by the way, so that I can look at it whenever I need it, remind myself to smile, take a deep breath, and relax before I help someone who's not having an emergency. And these tools make it more fun because sometimes it can sound a little like this if you're telling somebody to calm down. So it's a way to kind of say... Do it in a more of a kid-friendly way that seems kind of silly. And really what you're doing without them realizing it is you're also redirecting their attention. So now they're focused on washing their hands. They've had about a 25-second relaxation moment, and they come back like this. They don't realize they just walked away and took deep breaths. So it's a way to start programming that and creating that roadmap before the language is there, as you pointed out. Thanks. So now it's your turn. Oh, wow, well, I'm back up. Okay. All right, so now, as you can guess, we're going to do the third dot. So to go through a few of the um, ones, we, we concentrated on flip it, which is an awesome one. Feelings, limits, increase, prompts. Don't flip the lid, flip it. Set clear expectations, modeling appropriate behaviors, redirecting, kind of curbing that behavior to some, focusing attention on something else. Logical consequences, when you put your shoes on, then you can go outside not even presenting the alternative to that. And then actively ignoring inappropriate behaviors. I'd like you to think about your home <laughs> button. We have calmed the survival mode, right? We have helped them feel connected to us. We have a full bucket going in to the situation, right? But still, we have to teach appropriate behaviors. We, don't, we aren't born knowing how to handle the feeling of frustration or disappointment when playground time is over. So that's when the third dot comes in. How are you going to teach in a positive way how to handle that feeling of disappointed playground time is over? Take a moment with your group and fill out your third dot. How are you going to emphasize positive discipline? Which of the seven techniques or one of the tools that Caroline presented are you going to use? Go. 